Now, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. I've preached on this, on these verses before. But I didn't spend that much time on the rapture reference to these verses. Starting with verse 24, going through to verse 30. Let me just read those verses quickly and then we'll look into it a little deeper. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, people get confused with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, and there's all types of, quote, scholarly end of quote debate on that particular phrases concerning the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now the other gospels you see the kingdom of God used quite a bit. But Matthew chooses to use the kingdom of heaven as the primary way he's communicating what he's trying to put down in his writings for others to understand in the future. He probably never imagined all the controversy that would come from it, but I think it's silly the way these scholars and non-scholars debate over the King of God and the King of Heaven. I'm not going to get into all the specifics and the details of that. That's not the purpose of this message tonight. Let me tell you this one thing. Both terms describe the government of God. One emphasizes the ruler of that kingdom, which obviously is God, and the other emphasizes the present location of the throne of the government, heaven. You probably should also write it down in your notes for future references that the word heaven is also used as a euphemism for God. So these two phrases, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, closely really mean the same thing. The kingdom ruled by God in heaven will ultimately come, the, that kingdom will come to earth when Jesus returns. Now, I'm not going into what return that would be this evening. That's for another time. And that's just a real quick definition of what I believe the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven represent. Maybe some other time I'll do a more thorough teaching on it and how this debate started and why it's gone in every direction possible. But back to the verses. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while, ten, well, by, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath he tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now we've been looking at the rapture, and I repeat, I believe in a rapture, but not the way it's taught. I don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, because you know what I've already believe it concerning the Great Tribulation, as they call it. And I don't believe mid-tribulation. 
And if you're not aware of what I've taught on any of these subjects, I encourage you to go to the Last Day series, either listen to it or read it. There's 16 volumes and there's hundreds of messages on video. So let's get the first thing out of the way first. The word rapture is not found anywhere in the Bible. It kind of was coined from the words caught up, which we found, because we already looked into it, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. But tonight I want to lay down a biblical bomb against the rapture teaching that's going out there right now, that has been for the last at least a solid 50 decades. More than that, but... Predominantly, the greatest impact in the present rapture teaching doctrine has happened in the last 50 years. In this chapter, Jesus is telling a parable and he's teaching his disciples a lesson concerning what would happen, the events of the last days and the second coming which we just read here in Matthew 13 verses 24 through 30. If you really think about it, because everyone knows the pre-tribulation rapture theory. So what are we being told about this pre-tribulation rapture theory? Are we to believe it? You already know my answer to that. No. If you look at this particular chapter and verses that go along with it. What is it be, what's being said here? It's saying that Christ will gather His people before the tribulation separate the wheats and tares? Is that what it's saying? There's a rhetorical question. No. It never says that in this chapter or in these verses. It doesn't say that His people, Christ that is, His people will be gathered before the tribulation and separated the wheat from the tares before the harvest? Does it? Now I read through those verses quickly, but if you need to read them again, read them again. So what does it clearly state in these verses, in these scriptures? That the separation only takes place at the harvest. What does it say? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together. Underlie that. Let both grow together until the harvest. And the pre rapture and the mid rapture people will say, Well, the rapture is the harvest. Okay, so those who you, of you who believe that, who hold to the pre-tribulation rapture theory, you're saying the harvest takes place before the tribulation and for, before the end of the world. That's what they preach. People will not see the great tribulation. Let me tell you right now, ever since the abomination of desolation, the tribulation has been here. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Tell people that have died, not by the hundreds, not by the thousands, not by the ten, ten thousands, by the hundreds of millions of Christians that have died for their faith. Since Christ walked this planet, especially during the sixth and seventh beast reign. I mean, the, yeah, this... 6th and 7th beast, no, 7th and 8th beast reign, excuse me. Tell those Christians that were burned alive, that were tortured, that were beheaded, that were cruelly beaten and treated, some in prison for years, that they didn't go through a great tribulation. Well, that, well, the great tribulation that they're speaking of is when God's wrath finally is issued out at the end of times. No, it isn't. You're connecting God's wrath with a great 
tribulation period. The two are separate. The great tribulation period looked like a walk in the park compared to when God's wrath finally comes down. And I'll have more to say about that in the future. This is clearly what they believe. Oh, the church will be raptured before the tribulation and before the end of the world. And after they're raptured, seven years of great tribulation will happen. And then another thousand years after that, and after the rapture. Well, is that what Jesus said? Is that what Jesus taught his disciples? Let's read Matthew 13, 38 and 40. 38 and 40. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Jesus is explaining the parable now. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world. I think Jesus clears it up, to tell you the truth. I think it's quite obvious when you read the scriptures, you know, just take the word of these false doctrine relayers of the false doctrine, preachers, teachers, whoever, that came up with this man-made doctrine. And just read God's Word. What does it say? We just read the verses. The church and the wicked will continue to live together until the end of the world. The Scripture doesn't say any different, does it? Prove it to me where it says that the Christians will be raptured seven years prior or the Christians will be raptured and taken off before God deals with everything else. Years ahead of time. That will be spared for how, forever how long God decides that there's going to be a tribulation before He issues out His wrath. It doesn't say that anywhere. This is all man-made stuff, is what I'm trying to stay, say to you tonight. The church and the wicked will continue to live together on earth until the end of the world. And furthermore, write this down so you can remember it. And it's at the end of the world that the separation takes place. What is it, verse 30 said? Or say, let both go together until the harvest. Until the harvest. By the way, the harvest is dealing with wheat and tares. Some super spiritual Christians just believe that the harvest is referring to Christians. No. It's wheat and tears. The pre-trib rapture doctrine, just by this chapter alone, the verses we look at, we've been looking at, is obvious to see it's a false doctrine. Because it gets blown apart, not by my words, but what God says in His Word. The rapture theory, the rapture doctrine, the rapture false doctrine, teaches a separation before the end. God's Word teaches that there is no separation. 
none whatsoever before the end. Which also disproves also, using God's word rightly divided, the word cut straight. It proves that these mid-tribulation rapture people are also teaching a false doctrine. Whether it's pre or mid, it doesn't make any difference. They're wrong. The, that the, they're wrong because the separation does not take place before the end of the world. That's it. The separation does take place at the end of the world, both of the wheat and tares. Just write these verses down because I want to make sure I get enough time in this message to read you something also. John 6.40, write that verse, verse down. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. John 11.24 Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at that last day. John 12, 48. He that rejected me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. None of them said the last day minus seven years, the last day minus three and a half years. No, they're all referring to what this chapter in Matthew 13 is referring to, the last day events. Eternal life is given in a new glorious body in the last day. The resurrection of the new glorious body happens on the last day. Judgment is given on the last day. One other verse. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Why would Jesus reassure not only his disciples, but everyone that became a follower of Jesus from that point on, that he would be with us until the end of the world, if we were going to be raptured before the end of the world. It doesn't add up. The rapture teaches a false doctrine. It is invented by, I was going to say false preachers, but no, it was invented by the devil. It was a, there's no nice way of saying this. There's no polite way of saying this. I'm done with politeness. These are man-made doctrines that the devil influenced. And what it does is cause people to be unprepared. Unprepared for whatever, la whatever happens from now, 1021 to uh, 2021, until the last day, if you're still alive. They cause people to be unprepared for whatever we will go through. This is just some more verses that verifies when a rapture will happen. And it will happen at that separation day. At that separation day, my friend. As we've seen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and other verses. Now I want to read to you as an author, most of the time I do not agree with. But I could actually pull out a page and a half out of this whole book that might communicate it to you in a different style than I preach. Not that I think you need it, but when I can find something, it's great that 
I can read it to you. Regarding this Matthew 13 parable, Jesus unpacked this parable for his disciples by explaining that he is the sower. The field is the world, the wheat is the people of the kingdom, and the tares are the people of the evil one. And that pesky enemy that sows all the evil people among the wheat, that's the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. In this story, Jesus is predicting what it would be like for us as his church. He basically is saying while we're, while we're here on earth, it's going to be a mixed bag. True Christians and false Christians will live together in the same world. Now this author is suggesting that it's referring true Christians and false Christians in this Matthew 13. I haven't made that total leap yet, but I'm definitely considering it. True Christians and false Christians will live together in the same world, even gathering to, together in the same sanctuary, in the same worship service, singing the same songs, and listening to the same sermons. And to all those sickle happy Christians who want to go ahead and weed out the tares now, he says, wait. Back to waiting again. I just preached the message on that. It's not our job. And if we made it our business, we inevitably have some weak casualties in our hands. This parable would have been more easily understood by a person living in the first century Roman Empire because sowing tares in someone else's field was actually a thing, a kind of primitive bioterrorism. As New Testament scholar puts it, there was even Roman laws in place that prohibited it. The word translated as tares in this passage is not just a generic word for weeds. It describes a specific weed, darnel, which is why I preached the whole message on that. I don't know where you can find it on the website, but it's there. It describes a specific weed, darnel, I think it's in written form too, which looks very similar to wheat as it matures, but its grains are dark and poisonous. If an ancient farmer found darnel among his wheat crop, he wouldn't try to uproot it its uproot at first because he would probably lose some wheat in the process. He would wait until the whole field was ripe, at which time he could harvest the wheat. Some of the darnel might be uprooted in the process, but that didn't matter because the whole field would be weeded after harvest anyway. <coughs> Notice that in Jesus' parable, the order of events is reversed. The tares are pulled up first. That's right. We read that. Where do you see that? Verse 30, Matthew 13, Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares. Now that's something, isn't it? To think about. And bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn. Now that's interesting, isn't it? We are told over and over for many decades now the Christians will be gathered first that are alive in the last day. That's interesting, isn't it? I personally believe the terrorists will be marked. The angels will, will know where to go, what to do in the reaping process. The tares are pulled up first, then the wheat. But the one doing the harvesting is no ordinary ancient farmer. Jesus will send his angels to weed out with razor sharp precision everything that causes an sin and all who do evil, allowing the righteous to shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. In other words, 
If we try to remove the tares, we make a mess of everything and heck the field and hack the field to pieces. For now, we must realize that wheat and tares will grow together looking very much alike. So what are we to make of this? Does this mean we should never criticize or disagree with anyone? Does it mean we shouldn't call out error and name false teachers? On the contrary, the Bible overflows with passages encouraging Christians to do just that, to practice discernment. This is what Christians have been tasked with since the very beginning. Why? Because Jesus predicted that wolves would invade his church. He warned that all kinds of false teachers and deceitful charlatans would rise up from within and present their bogus teachings as legitimate. We see that warning in Matthew 24 over and over, I believe three times. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. These teachers would look like sheep, talk like sheep, walk like sheep, act like sheep. But these sheepy looking beasts wouldn't be looking to snack on grass and clover. They would, these would be carnivorous hunters looking to sink their chops into a nice juicy sheep steak. While wheat and tares present true believers and false ones, a predatory wolf is a whole different animal. This can be especially confusing for the flock when the wolf in question is dressed up like a shepherd. The one person with whom the sheep are conditioned to feel safe. That's enough of that. Anyone that's been following this ministry for any period of time <clears throat> I've been pointing out for years now false doctrine on top of false doctrine and I repeat these look-alikes these pretenders these wolves in sheep clothing are going to be with us until the end of the world just as those scriptures that I read the three in John and the one in Matthew they're all going to be around until the last day until the last trumpet sounds and by the way I'm going to go into the six trumpets Right after I'm done with this rapture section of the last days. You already know what the seventh one is, but I'll review it when I get there. Well, have they happened? We'll see. Is your stump st still waiting to happen? We'll see. But this chapter in Matthew, and not just this chapter, but it's clear here what happens at the last day when the harvest takes place. People of God and all the rest, including false Christians, will live, be living side by side until the end of the world. I come against this false doctrines because as I said a few moments ago by preaching these false doctrines what you are doing is giving the devil ammo to attack 
saints into believing and not preparing for what is to come. Most Christians believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. They're going to escape all troubles and problems. I come along and say, we've been living in the Great Tribulation. Just look at the last 1,300 years alone and what has happened. Unfortunately, people don't know much about history. In the elementary stage and even at the college level. If they did and they combined it with the Word of God, they would see for themselves what a great tribulation looks like these last 1300 years plus especially since the 7th and 8th beast has been in existence. Don't mix, mix the great tribulation up with God's wrath. The cup that's going to be poured out that contains His wrath. That's a whole other subject. Be prepared. There's not going to be an escape button to what's coming, whatever is coming, until now and when Jesus returns. Be watchful, be ready, be prepared to be continued. I want to hear from you.